everybody. Please have a seat. I want to tell you a quick story. Um, so today is daylight savings time. How many of you are tired? Getting up an hour earlier. That, that's hard, right? So my story is a long time ago when my son David was about seven years old. Is anyone here about seven? Give or take a little bit. No? So I forgot about the time change on Sunday morning. And when we got to church, it was right at communion. And my son David said to me, what's going on? And I said, I'll tell you later. <laughs> Just walk up, get communion, I'll tell you when we sit down. So we walked straight up, got communion, sat down. And then I said, I forgot that the time changed and church is almost over. <laughs> and David said, how much church is left? <laughs> And I said one prayer and one song. And he turned around to his best friend in the pew behind him and said very loudly, my mom forgot that it was church and I only have to sit through one more prayer and one more song. <laughs> he kind of sounded like he'd gotten out of jail early. <laughs> he was that happy about it. So every time when it gets to be this Sunday, that's the story I remember. But that's not what I want to talk about today. I kind of want to talk about sports a little bit. How many of you play a sport or have played a sport at some time in your life? So lots of friends play sports. How many of you like sports, kind of follow them, right? So if you follow sports, you have teams that you like, right? You're a fan. You want them to win. But you've also got teams that you really dislike, right? That you really want them to lose. And you don't have to raise your hand, but is that true, kind of true? There's some teams that you really would give anything for them to lose, and you're devastated if they win, especially if they beat your team. So our Bible story today is kind of like people being on different teams, right? It's Jesus who comes up to a well where there's water. He's thirsty, he wants a drink, and there's a woman there. The problem is, she's on the other team. She and Jesus aren't on the same team. She's a Sumerian, that's one team, and he's a Jew, that's another team. And the rule is that Jews and Sumerians never talk to each other. They haven't talked to each other forever. They've been fighting with each other forever. The second rule is that men never talk to women during that time. Men and women did not talk to each other. Men talked to men, women talked to women, but they never talked to each other. And Jesus broke both of, this rule, both of these rules by talking to this woman. So why do you think that there would be a rule about people not talking to each other? Why have a rule like that? What's the point? Can anybody think of anybody? What's the point of having rules where people don't get to talk to each other? Like, no one's talking to me now. <laughs> Why? Why would we have that rule? It humanizes the enemy. It humanizes the enemy, absolutely, right. We do not want to have any sympathy for the enemy at all. It also keeps people apart, right? It keeps people apart. Everybody's in their own group. Everybody's in their own camp. We're never going to talk to them because they're not like us. So Jesus and the Samaritan woman, the woman from Samaria, start talking to each other. And that is a really, really big deal. It shouldn't have happened. They should have never done it. But Jesus is thirsty. The woman has water. And so they start talking. So I was wondering, why would Jesus do this? Why would Jesus start talking to someone he knew that he wasn't supposed to talk to? Why, why do you think? Because they wanted what? Women and men to talk to each other. Because they wanted women. 
heaven and men to talk to each other. Yeah. And Jesus made that possible, right? He showed that men and women can talk to each other. And maybe before that, people didn't know that. And it's an important thing to know, right? Men and women should be talk, able to talk to each other. In fact, we all should be able to talk to each other. So by doing that, Jesus was showing people that there's a different way to do things, right? A lot of times we're kind of stuck in our own ways. And if there's someone that we don't like, we probably ignore them, right? We don't talk to them. And that's one way to do things. That's one way to be. But it's not the only way. Sometimes it's good to talk to people that aren't like you. Even to talk to people that you might not normally talk to. Now, is that easy or hard to do? It depends, yeah. Sometimes, it, sometimes we have courage and, and we feel open and we want to talk to people that are different than us. Sometimes we really don't. But what Jesus was doing was he was breaking all the rules, right? And so as he's talking to this woman, he starts talking about something really kind of strange. He starts talking about water. Now they're at, at a well, it's high noon, he's thirsty, this person is getting water. So they start talking about water. But the kind of water that Jesus is talking about is not the kind of water that you drink. Jesus is telling the woman, I have a different kind of water that I want to give you as a gift. It's a kind of water called living water, and it will give you new life. Now, what do you think new life is? Any ideas about what that might be, what that means? Right. The woman didn't know either. She had no idea what he was talking about. But the fact that he was talking to her was really important to her. Right? The fact that he would look at her and really see her, right? And that he was listening to her. That meant a lot to her. And so she started thinking, you know, this living water must be something kind of special. And so she asked for it. She said, I want that gift. I want that living water that you want to give me as a gift. And so, one of the things that this story is about is the way that Jesus was willing to see people and talk to people and be with people that other people ignored. The other thing that it's about is how Jesus gives a gift to each one of us. Jesus gives us a way to all kind of look at the way we live and think about it and think about if there's things that we want to do differently and then gives us the courage to do them, to live in a new way that is kinder to other people, that includes other people, that helps us really, really see other people and accept them for who they are. And although this story was a long, long, long time ago, it still happens today. And so I have a short story about something that I encountered that kind of gave me a glimpse of new life. So last weekend, I wasn't at church, which is not really usual. I'm, I'm usually here. I try really hard to be here most of the time. But last week, I was away. And the gift of new life kind of came to me because of where I was and what I was doing. Last week, I was at Bishop's Ranch at the women's retreat. How many of you know there was a women's retreat? Yeah. Uh, and there were about 38 women there, including me. Some of the women were from St. John's. Some of them weren't. Some of them had been invited by someone else, or they'd gone to St. John's a long time ago and just came back for the retreat. So we weren't a group of women who necessarily knew each other very well. But it was really nice to see all these different women coming together, wanting to be together for this weekend. And we kind of broke the rules of getting out of our comfort zone and the groups that we were used to being in, wherever we lived and whatever we did, in order to be together with each other. So most retreats have a topic, something that you talk about. 
when you go on them, something you focus on. And the topic of this retreat was grief. Does anybody know what that word means, what grief is? Can anybody just give me an idea? Olivia, do you want to say nothing? No. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. So grief is a special kind of sadness, right? It's a special kind of sadness that um, when we lose something or lose someone and we miss them very much or so we lose something precious to us that we miss very much, we feel grief. Now that's not a very easy topic to have a retreat on. That, that's, not, that's not usually what retreats are about, but that was what this one was about. So these particular women came together because they were willing to share about grief. So the retreat leader was very clear that we weren't there to solve anything or to have answers or to figure out how to make grief go away. That wasn't why we were together. We were there to hold space for each other. That's kind of a weird term. Holding space means kind of like what we're doing now together, where we're willing to come together and be together. No matter who we are, no matter where we came from, no matter what's going on in our lives, we come together in a special way to be there for each other. And that's what she was telling us to do. She just wanted us to be there and listen to each other. She wanted us to be present for each other. No judgment, no advice, no solutions. So that was a really special thing. And as I was there with these other women, just being with them and listening to their stories and how they were feeling and just showing them that I cared without giving them advice or telling them what to do, I felt something change in me. I felt a kind of new life, a way of feeling like I really was able to hear and be in a different way than I'd been before. And it was a gift to me. It came from seeing others deeply and also allowing them to see me, to really see me deeply, just as I am. Not the best Lori, not the worst Lori, but the real Lori, right? That's not always an easy thing to do, to accomplish, but that's kind of what we were able to get to just by simply being together and sharing really hard stories and then just showing that we cared about each other enough to listen to those stories. Now, that was a week ago, and when I came away from that retreat, I felt a calmness that I have not felt in a very, very long time. But as the week wore on after I left the retreat, that calmness began to fade away a little bit. <laughs> it was kind of hard to hold on to. Because everyday life sometimes interferes with the flourishing of new life. It can be hard to hold on to new life when so many things are trying to get our attention all the time, every single day. But just under the surface of those daily routines and all those things that try to distract us, Jesus continues to call us to new life. You see, Jesus encountered a woman who may not have even known that living water was an option. She didn't know that new life was even a possibility for her. And Jesus, who was never one to shy away from breaking the rules, shared a gift with someone that he wasn't even supposed to be talking to. He not only talked to her, he listened to her, he saw her, and he gave her the gift of God's love. And that is a really, really big deal. After their encounter, after Jesus and this woman had talked to each other, she went back to her people. Remember, she wasn't on Jesus' team. She was part of another group. So she went back to her team, and she told them what had happened. And those people told other people, and those people told other people, and on and on for
for generations until here we are today, part of an ongoing invitation to embrace new life. We're all invited to break away from old patterns and live our lives differently. We're invited to live more authentically by being more connected to God and to each other. We're invited to boldly blur the lines and break the rules which separate us in order to hold space for everyone. Because new life needs space to flourish and to grow. And God is always calling us to create space where everyone has access to the living water of new life.